Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session, uh, Ansible for the Windows admin. Uh, my name is Jeremy Murrah, and I've been using Ansible for a couple years now, back in uh, the boring day job. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been really useful and powerful um, and exciting. But it seemed weird. It seemed like there was not a lot of uh, uh, engagement uh, in the Windows space for Ansible. Uh, that could just be my perception, but that, that's what it seemed like. So I wanted to fix that. So that's why I'm here talking to all of you. So real quick, uh, show of hands, who here is using Ansible at all? Or in the sun? OK, good, good. I'm going to see every hand at the end of this, hopefully. Um, who's using it for just Linux or network type stuff? OK, so the rest of you guys are using it for Windows to some degree. Cool, all right, good deal. Um, so I'm uh, going to take a little different take on this. Uh, Ansible is a huge topic, and there's a lot to cover, and I could probably spend all three days talking about it. Um, so I wanted to kind of cherry pick stuff. I want to focus on everything that you would need to know to be effective with Ansible for Windows, for Windows and PowerShell. That's kind of where I want to want to touch on. So I'm going to do some, some, some intro, and I'm going to do some intermediary stuff. It's all Windows focused, and we're going to get weird, and we're going to write some some custom modules with PowerShell and do dumb stuff at the end. So I'm going to kind of skip around. So there's way more that I don't cover than there is that I do. Um, I, I've tried to put a bunch of uh, links in the bottom of the slides uh, for a lot of stuff. So I sort of have that as reference, and I've got some links at the end. Uh, luckily, the documentation for Ansible is really good. It's kind of surprising, but that's great. So you can really um, kind of pick up that. So my hope is to get you excited about using it and show you some of the possibilities. So. And because we're so action-packed, let's just go ahead and get started at the beginning. So what is Ansible? Well, that's the first thing you need to know about it, and we could probably end the conversation there. Ansible is agentless. Uh, if you're in a very large environment, that's hopefully a very exciting thing for you. Um, more, more important than that, uh, Ansible is a declarative configuration tool uh, along the lines of Chef or Puppet or Salt, kind of like DSC. Uh, the idea being you, you declare a state for your machines and sort of design configurations, say, this is how my machine should look. Uh, the other part of that is human-readable configuration. There's a sort of understanding that anything you describe about your machine when you declare state should be readable. I like to think of the boss test. Your boss should be able to walk over your shoulder and look at it and kind of be able to tell what it is it's doing. That way he doesn't ask you and you have to explain it to him. And that's, so. uh, it's agentless. If I mention it, it's, it's cool. Um, it's uh, pretty awesome. It uses, uh, it uses WinRM for all of its Windows interactions. So it makes a WinRM connection just like PowerShell remoting, PS sessions, all that same kind of deal. Executes its, its payload and then comes back. So uh, there's, no, uh, there's no agents to install or no pre-configuration. And that's important because if you're in a large environment and you say, hey, I want to use this new tool, but before I can even touch it, I've got to go make a configuration and on 5,000 servers, that's not going to happen. So none of that's necessary. We'll talk about the sort of progress of that over the years. Um, in comparison to something like Chef or Puppet, it's sort of a distributed serverless sort of thing. There's not this master control server that you have to stand up or anything like that. It's, it's basically a Linux program. It's a bunch of Python scripts bundled up. So anything that can run uh, Python, uh, Linux, Linux programs, so pretty much any distribution can run it. And it's, it's the entire thing. It's everything goes from there, very push mode sort of uh, distributed. So, um, oh, and it's, it's agentless if I didn't mention that. So <laughs> keep, that, keep that in mind. Um, so with all of that going for it, all those super cool things and the agent list thing, why is nobody talking about it, at least in the Windows space? Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different reasons that I wanted to kind of touch on a few that I thought might be misconceptions about why people are not using Ansible or why you may have ignored it, because these are why I ignored it for a while. First one being that it's just for Linux, which is understandable, because it was invented by a guy at Red Hat who actually tried to sell it to him, and they didn't want it, so he quit, made his own company, and then sold it to him for like a million dollars or something. So. <laughs> it's a pretty cool story. But, uh, so it's for, it, was, it was written by Linux for Linux and kind of came up as a Linux configuration management tool. And if you looked at this even like a year ago, you'd say, oh, this is great for Linux, Windows, eh. There's been a lot of changes lately, so definitely look at it again. A lot of stuff happens automatically. You have the Kerberos stuff in the pre-configuration, and Windows works great. Uh, if I were uh, wearing a, a suit and a tie, I would say it's a first-class citizen. But I'm not going to say that because I don't do that sort of stuff. So I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> But somebody else might say that. Um, the other big thing which I, I worried about was, was I don't know Python. Of course, Don said I got to learn Python, so I guess I got to go learn Python now. So, but uh, you don't need to know it, and I didn't know, but I thought it was important, um, and, which is understandable because in DSC it's very helpful to know PowerShell. Um, I understand that in Chef and Puppet it's very helpful to know Ruby. Ansible, it, it doesn't really matter. I still don't know Python. I almost purposely didn't learn Python just to see how much I could do without it, um, which is kind of weird. but. Uh, yeah, so it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been a problem. There's not anything that you need to know about Python. You do everything through YAML or JSON. 
uh, some stuff in, in PowerShell uh, and all that. So uh, The other big thing was that I was already using DSC. Why do I need Ansible? They're, they're, it's one or the other, right? I only need one tool. Uh, I really thought of them as, as sort of competing in the same space, and that's not really the case. They're very much more complementary. Um, for anyone who's done DSC, have, has anyone done uh, encrypted credentials in a MOF file before? Anyone? Was that a pleasant experience? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's sucky. Um, so there's things that DSC does really well, and there's some things that it, they don't have the tooling for, and a lot of people try to write tooling and figure out how to make up for those things. Ansible fits really well with all those pieces, so things that DSC isn't great at, Ansible kind of takes up the mantle, and they work really well together. Likewise, uh, all that knowledge you have about PowerShell and DSC, if you're already using it, doesn't go out the door. It all, it, 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 it's complementary, and it builds you up. So don't consider this like throwing away any sort of previous experience or anything like that. And, well, so this last one, that's valid. <laughs> that's still valid, case sensitive. I, I've made a, a really long, good career ignoring case. Um, and it's, but I'm gonna just punt and I'm gonna blame the PowerShell team. It's their fault that we have to care about this now. So, yeah, it's gonna bite you and it's gonna suck. And near as I can tell, case sensitive programming just means use lowercase for everything. I, I don't know. <laughs> so. That seems to be about the best way to just ignore it entirely, um, but that's something to kind of be aware of. So, um, so let's dive right in and kind of do a level set. Uh, again, I've got, a, I've got probably more slides than I need, and I might skip some as we go, but I wanted to have kind of this reference material if you go back and look at it later. Because, you know, some people know about this stuff and some people don't, but I want to kind of get everybody on the same sheet. So as you're reading documentation on Ansible and, and sending it up, there's a lot of terms that may or may not make sense. Uh, so the first three, task, play, and playbook, those are sort of the basic elements of your Ansible interaction. Uh, a playbook being the, the sort of the file that you're gonna run when you, when you run something. If you're familiar with DSC, this would be kind of like the configuration, um, or kind of like the MOF, I guess. It's, it's sort of the unit of execution. Um, and a play, basically, that's a combination of tasks, which are the, the sequences of action that you're gonna do on a system, like copying a file or installing a program, that sort of thing, and a, uh, a list of hosts. And hosts are those machines that you're gonna act upon. It can be a group of machines, that can be one machine, that can be, you know, 100,000, whatever. Um, so a playbook is you, you take the, that combination of tasks, your, your execution sequence, and your machines, put them together, and then put them in a file, and that's your playbook. And then a play is, is, is well, well, we'll talk about the difference between plays and a playbook here in a minute in the demo. Uh, likewise, hosts and inventory, those are sort of interchangeable terms. Uh, they basically mean the exact same thing, and that is, it refers to the machines you're going to act upon, the file that you define those machines in. We'll talk about that in the demo about how you have to sort of define that. But that's an interchangeable term. It means the same thing. Uh, likewise, uh, vars and facts. Uh, those are interchangeable terms. Those are just variables. It just means variables. Ansible's real good about uh, setting variables everywhere. It's like glitter. It's just everywhere and it's a big mess. It's useful if you like glitter. Um, but uh, Ansible's good about you can, you can gather information back from a host. So it's a very much of a two-way communication, which is cool. Um, and, and vars and facts are, are terms for uh, how you do that interaction and store that. So that's all that means with variables. Uh, the last two here are not Ansible specific, but when I first started getting involved with Ansible with my first sort of foray into JSON and YAML, and I was very confused at first by these terms. I didn't quite really understand what a list and a dictionary were. That a list is just an array. If you're familiar with an array in PowerShell, list equals array. Just put that in your head. That's all it is. It's just multiple items in a, in a collection. Uh, and likewise, a dictionary is basically just a hash table. It's, it's a collection of key value pairs. So don't get, you know, there's things in .NET with different kinds of dictionaries, and it gets real weird in developer -y. It's not that bad in JSON and YAML. Just think list is an array, dictionary is a hash table. Um, so let's talk about some of these data files. YAML uh, is your primary interface with Ansible. It's where you write everything. And according to the internet, YAML stands for a couple of things. Uh, my favorite is that YAML ain't a markup language. And uh, YAML ain't a programming language either. But don't tell the folks at Ansible that, because they've <laughs> done a lot of work to make it a programming language, and it's pretty close. Uh, they've, they've basically taken YAML, added uh, Jidja, which is this framework for, for substituting text to do variable substitution. Uh, they've added uh, the concept of loops, so you can loop through a task multiple times. They've added conditionals, so you can do branching logic and decide whether or not you want to execute a task on a machine based on some criteria. So you add all those together, you've almost got a programming language. Not really, because you can do dumb stuff like this, where you're creating a variable, 
and then you're building a, a list and a dictionary on the fly and then referencing that. Anyway, that does not pass the boss test. Um, so don't do that. Um, I, I'm not going to cover a lot of best practices here. I'm just going to throw stuff at you. So, um, but I would, I would say that it's, it, there's a lot of stuff online and people ask questions on Stack Overflow about how to do this, how do I get these filters and do, try not to do that. You can and it's cool, but you shouldn't, probably, for, for a lot of different reasons, but I just want to bring that up. So let's talk about variables. Um, I heard, read somewhere once that every good slide deck needs an eye chart, so <laughs> I had to do, include at least one. Um, so this is a list, if you're, if you're the memorizing type, feel free to memorize that and we can have a test later. This is every place that you can put a variable in Ansible. Technically, this is also a precedence order, so you can put them everywhere and then try to figure out which one wins. Uh, don't do that either, by the way, that would just be horrible, but uh, I only include that so that you can kind of get an idea, and we'll see this in the demos. I try to put variables in a bunch of different places just so you can kind of see that so many things are just variables and, and, and you can reference them like that. Um, so the last thing is the last slide before we get into some fun stuff. So we've got our playbook. We've talked about that and our variables and our hosts, and we put all these in files. We've got to run something. Ansible-playbook is that something. That's the executable that you use and say, launch this playbook and go do all that magic. Uh, there's a bunch, I've got a link at the bottom. There's a whole bunch of options, but I wanted to include a couple in the slide. The idea of the theme with the options is to uh, allow you to sort of modify the way a playbook runs or your, your execution runs without going and cracking open the files. You build everything in your playbook and everything works great and you want to slightly modify it. So maybe you want to use step and you want to have it ask you for each step, hey, do you want to run this next one? Do you want to run this next one? That's great for debugging. You have uh, different verbosity levels. Uh, check mode is cool. Uh, it's kind of like a what if. So you can run a playbook that's supposed to change a bunch of stuff and you say, okay, don't change it, but let me know if you would have changed it as you run through it. That can be that can prove pretty useful. We'll talk about that more towards the end. So, um, all right. So let's do a demo. I've got a uh, uh, my poor little laptop here is gonna do some sweating. Uh, I've got uh, three VMs got a, uh, built with Vagrant Windows VMs, and I'm going to build a domain. Uh, I had this idea I was gonna do like a like a web farm and have like a store where I sold cupcakes. I thought that'd be cool and unique, but somebody said that was already done. So, uh, somebody did that one already. <laughs> um, but it's super flexible. In fact, it's so flexible. You can do almost anything in a demo, like run this presentation. So we're just going to have that do all of this for us. So let's do some uh, let's do some demos. Let me close all this. Don't look at that yet. We're not ready to look at that yet. Okay, so we're going to start here. This is VS Code. Hopefully, you all know it and love it. If you don't know it and love it, get it and then love it. It's fantastic. It's great for a lot of things, but it's really great for Ansible for a couple of reasons. Uh, VS Code really likes the folder-based structure, open a folder and, and reference everything, which is good because Git and source control programs like that too. Ansible likes it too, so it works really well. You kind of, everything you need to run Ansible can kind of be encapsulated in a folder. And so that fits really well with that. The other thing that's great is there's a lot of different file types in Ansible. It's not like just like one, you know, PowerShell is just one, one file type. Ansible does YAML and it does JSON and it does config and it does INI files and it can do some PowerShell and even Python if you're really crazy. Uh, and VS Code can parse all of those. So any file you open for Ansible, VS Code can realize it. Uh, so out of the box, it's great. It's great for this thing. There's a couple of changes you might want to do. The first being uh, the Ansible extension. That's uh, a, an extension, a VS Code extension that Microsoft writes. It does a bunch of different stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, I won't talk about a lot of what it does, but go install it. It adds some extra IntelliSense kind of stuff. It adds some code snippets for the task, which is really useful instead of going out to the documentation. Uh, that can that can be pretty helpful. A super quick install. And there's a couple. I've got a small settings file here, and these a lot of these are kind of personal preference. So file associations. Uh, I mentioned uh, I think earlier in the slides your host file, your inventory file where you store your host. We'll look at that in just a second. That is by default the INI file format. You don't usually put an extension on it. That's kind of, you can. Uh, that's kind of the, the the habit is to call it either inventory or hosts with no extension, and the VS Code says, ah, oh, it's text, and you get white, and that's fine. But if you put it in here and say, hey, it's an INI file, it'll do colors and stuff, so that's kind of handy. Um, one thing that the, the, code, uh, the Ansible extension for VS Code suggests, uh, or builds, is the Ansible file type. So VS Code parses YAML pretty well. Uh, if you tell it that it's Ansible instead of YAML, you get some extra stuff. Uh, I don't know what, I haven't actually done an AB, but the extension says it's better, so I'm just going to trust that it's better. Uh, so you can define your YAML files as Ansible files. 
and you can set your default language if that's the thing you want to do. Uh, the big one that I think is most useful, though, is to set your default shell. Everything we do with Ansible is going to be done in Linux. For me on Windows, that means Windows Subsystem for Linux, WSL. If you're on a Mac, then you can just use whatever Linux shell Mac uses. That's probably already by the, the default. So if you're using Windows, you set this. Otherwise, it would come up with PowerShell, and you get to type bash. And so this is, this is something I like to do. So Also, I wanted to have a segue to talk about the Windows subsystem for Linux. I'm a professional presenter, so we're going to do that. So I'm going to open up my shell, and because I've got my default here, it's going to launch me straight into bash. Um, I've also got some notes here. Uh, my original intention was to start with a plain vanilla, fresh downloaded uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. I put that file. And then walk through uh, setting that up and installing Ansible and doing all that kind of stuff. And it turns out that um, installing a bunch of packages is boring, uh, slow, and may or may not work on the Wi-Fi anyway. So I'm just going to skip all that. Um, but I've got, to, I've got this notes, and, and this whole slide deck is going to be available with all the code, so you can follow along. But I've got notes about how to install everything. Um, if you know what all those words mean, then you'll know there's a million different ways to install anything. Uh, I chose to use uh, pip, which is the Python installer because Ansible is just a bunch of Python stuff. I find that that is generally a newer version of Ansible than what you get in, in this case, Ubuntu's uh, app git or if yum, depending on your repo. So if you don't know what any of those words mean, just run that and you'll be good. If you do, then you already have an opinion on how you install stuff, and I'm not going to try to change your mind on any of that. But one thing I do want to mention, though, is, is a, a, a feature that was added in about Ansible 2.6 is um, an issue with file permissions and metadata. I've got a link here if you want to read all the gory details, but basically what happens, actually, let me run it. Let me run this real quick and I'll show you the error because you'll run into this, potentially, and you'll hate yourself when it doesn't work. Let's see if I remember to, to reset this right. Yeah, there we go. So you'll get an error like this whenever you try to run anything. Expand that up. Oh, scroll, where's my scroll going? Let me try it again. Resizing is still a little weird in VS Code. So you'll get this warning. Ansible is being run in a world writable directory, ignoring it as a config source. So basically, it won't read the files because it has basically everyone full control or everyone write access in, to use the Windows parlance. Uh, so if we did obscure Linux command number one, LL, to get a directory listing, if you either know what this means or you don't, but what imp what's important here is uh, this third kind of section of RWXs, that's the permission for everyone. And that W is basically everyone has write access. That's what Ansible's mad about. It doesn't want you to be able, everyone to be able to write to your config files, probably for security or something. So great. Well, just I'll go Google and look up obscure Linux command number two on how to change file permissions and run that. But it won't work. The reason being, with Windows Subsystem for Linux, what we're doing here is we're actually mounting our Windows C drive in WSL to access in Linux. And that's cool. But we're not, mounting, uh, we're not mounting it with metadata support to set Linux file permissions separate from Windows file permissions. Those are two separate things, until they aren't, because they keep changing WSL. So who knows? But uh, as of right, well, as of like a week ago, they were, they, were, uh, they were different. So we need to do something to WSL to tell it, hey, let me change file permissions. And the way you do that is with this WSL.conf file. You put in these options, you basically say, when you automatically mount the C drive, uh, mount it with metadata, and you mask and fmask are a way to kind of set default permissions. So don't worry about the specifics of that. So this is going to be my first test here. I am going to attempt to get in and out of Vim without destroying everything. So we'll see if I can pull that off. So we need to set that in our file. So I'm going to say sudo vim at cwsl.com. Put in my password. All right. Insert mode with the I, paste, escape, colon, write WQ, because that totally makes sense. It's good, right? OK, so now we have that file. Now we need to, hey, hey thank you, thank you. I'm a Linux admin now. Give me a job. <laughs> All right, well, that was successful. So, OK, so now we need to remount our, um, our volume here. Normally, uh, as of about a week ago, I would have simply just said exit and relaunched bash. But a week ago, I got uh, 1903 on my machine here, which broke my demo, and I had to scramble and fix it. Turns out now they have a feature where uh, WSL will stick around in the background for some undetermined number of minutes. So we're not going to stand here and awkwardly stare at each other for a few minutes. So I'm going to run. Big that up a little bit. Uh, or maybe not. It's not going to work. Oh, yeah. 
We're on WSL.exe. This is from uh, just command prompt. It's kind of an overarching control program. Terminate. I'm going to kill that sucker, Ubuntu. Kill it, and we launch it. And this is all in the notes, or you could manually mount it if you, know, you want to do all that kind of stuff. But, uh, and then if I do a directory listing, now I've got my permission set. Everyone does not have write access, and that will make Ansible happy, which will make me happy, and I'll hopefully make all of y'all happy. Everybody will be happy. Uh, so now if I run Ansible, let me span this up. Now if I run Ansible Playbook, it should work. There we go, and now it's running. So like a good cooking show, I'm going to stick that in the oven and close that, and we'll come back to it. So let's talk about what we're doing now. Let's talk about our, our Ansible file. So now we have VS Code set up the way we like it. We've got WSL set up the way we like it. We have a configuration management environment with a couple of free downloads in our work machine, and no one's the wiser which is cool. So let's talk about some files. There's two files to start we're going to care about, sort of our basic needs, and that is our playbook and our hosts file. And if I resize this, it's going to screw up my running program, so we're just going to kind of, you can read that in the back, right? It's funny thing. Okay. So let's talk about our hosts file first, because that's smaller. And that is basically just a list of our machines. So in our lab, we have three machines. We're going to have two domain controllers and one member server. Uh, I've defined groups with the square brackets. That's I and I formatting stuff. So I have two host names. I've defined some variables. So this is the first place you'll see a variable out of that list of like 42. Uh, in this case, I'm defining the Ansible host name. I'm cheating here. If I were back at work, I'd have DNS and AD and all that kind of fancy fun stuff, mostly just DNS, and I could just use a fully qualified name there, and that would be fine. Because I don't have that yet, I'm going to build that uh, in a minute. I'm going to cheat, and I'm just going to statically define the Ansible host. Um, just to kind of illustrate that you can do that. You can set all kinds of variables there, too, that are going to be host specific, and that's important because they're going to be scoped to that one machine. There's different, where you put variables will sort of define how they're scoped. These are host specific variables here. So, Okay, so that's our host file. Let me just drag that over a little bit. Now we know what that's all about. And let's look at our playbook. Our playbook is YAML. We're going to start off our playbook defining the hosts we're going to run this against. We're using a group. Hosts, you can put all kinds of stuff there. So all just kind of means everything that's in that file, not everything on your network. Ooh, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> once, it would be even once. Um, so you can put a machine name, or you can put a group. Um, you can put, you know, comma separated list or a li you know static list of machines. How, you know, there's a lot of different ways to define your hosts. I'm just going to do it this against everything. Uh, gather facts is something that's handy. That will actually run a module, kind of a pre-task thing. It goes out to the machine, gathers a whole bunch of data, stuff like disk space and disk information, uh, environment variables, uh, memory and uh, CPU info, IP address, that kind of stuff. A bunch of bunch of information that you can use for some YAML programming later, which we'll get into. And then we're going to start our tasks. And this is going to be a list of tasks, which if you're using something like DSC, will kind of start to look familiar. You basically define what the task is, the module. In this case, this is win user. And then you pass parameters. And every one of these, these tasks is kind of the same. You define the module you're going to use, and you give it a bunch of parameters. Um, now, the, the other second best practice, I would say, and that's the last one, because everything else is just a bad idea in here. Uh, is, is use the name field. This is an optional, optional parameter on every task. Highly, highly, highly recommended. This is the boss line. This is where you put in there what the thing is doing, and it's free form text. You can type whatever you want. That is helpful when someone's reading your playbook. Uh, that is helpful when someone's looking at your output. When we finish our, our cooking our chicken there, we'll see in the output this comes through, so you'll be able to see what it is, has done in the past. So highly recommended to do that. Uh, everything else is, is, is up to you. So like, for instance, our, our lab here, we're going to go through and we're going to, this is a couple of machines I built with Vagrant, so I'm going to set our administrator password to something I know. And yes, that's a bad idea. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to disable our Windows Update service. So this is kind of stuff you might see in something like DSC or any, cool, any, any configuration management tool. And you can do comments. I commented that out. I don't even remember why now, but I left that in to show you comments. Um, you can install uh, features. So we're going to use win feature, and we're going to do some extra stuff. Win feature starts to look normal, right? You set the state and the name, and we're going to do the sub-features and all that. But then we're going to use win, which is a conditional. And what we're going to say is when the mem total MB property of Ansible facts, and Ansible facts is a variable that was created when we did our gather facts at the beginning, went and gathered a bunch of information, that's where it stuck it, in that variable. When that mem total MB property is equal to 4096, 
then we want to install ADDS. And the reason I did that is my DCs have four gig of RAM, my memory server has two. I just kind of wanted to have an excuse to show that, that, that feature. And we'll see in the output when it runs how it kind of decides what to run on. Um, and we're also going to do this register. And register just means take whatever happened with that task, the entire output of that task execution, and stick it in another variable, in this case called ADDS underscore install. Because then we can do stuff with that, which we're going to do here in a minute. So our, tech, second, our next task here is uh, after we install domain services feature, if we installed it, we want to reboot. And the reason we don't just plain reboot is, is we want this entire thing to run in sort of an idempotent way. right? And, and with Ansible being more freeform, it's, a, it's more up to us to make that happen. So if I ran this multiple times, I'm only going to install ADDS once, right? because I'm declaring the state of present. But if I run that, that second time and it, it says, oh, yeah, ADDS is installed, it wouldn't change anything. I don't need to reboot. I don't want to reboot my, my domain controller every time I install ADDS. That would be very bad. Um, and so what we can do, because Ansible is super cool, is we can reference this changed property. Ansible keeps track of, you know, it's idempotent, so it sets a machine to be in a certain state. But it will tell you if it was already in that state or not. So it returns back, uh, yes, OK, it was already in the state, everything's fine. Or, yes, OK, everything's fine, but I had to actually make a change to make it fine. It keeps, those are two different states. And that's super cool, because it allows you to do things like only reboot if you actually made a change. And now the second time I run this playbook, it's not going to reboot. Very idempotent. And that's very cool. Um, and then we're going to set our DNS client settings so we can build our domain. There's a ton of modules out there. You can check the documentation. Every version. Yes? It will reboot immediately on that. I'm calling it test directly. It will reboot, wait for it to come back up, and then continue on. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about another way of doing it where you can kick it off at the end. Yeah, in the next demo, I'll show a different way of doing that, that, that does that, yeah. OK, let's see how our turkey's doing here. Hey, we're done. Cool. OK, let me go to the top, and we'll pretend we're running this fresh. OK, so here's what the output looks like. Play all. That's the, the group of machines that I'm running against. And then it starts running tasks. Uh, technically, the gather facts thing is just the setup module. It's, just, it's a task. It just runs ahead of time. Uh, so that's the task. You see, it, it, it was OK. It didn't change anything because it was gathering data, so it comes back. That's supposed to be green. I don't know if that. Yeah, that's green. Huh. All right. Uh, and then the next one, we changed our administrator password. And that actually did make a change. It somehow did some magic to tell that the password was different. I don't know how that works, but that's cool. So it actually changed the password and comes back for each machine independently uh, the status. Our Windows Update service was already stopped and disabled, so there was no change to make. So that came back green. And then we hit our first conditional, right? We uh, skipped server three because it only had two gig of RAM. And it reports back, status skipped. Uh, and the other two, we actually installed it, so it came back changed. And then likewise with the reboot. Since we didn't install ADDS, we're not going to reboot server three. It skips that one, too. And indeed, you know, So if I ran this a second time, you'd see skipped on all three of those because it's already installed, and it, wouldn't have, it would say OK at the task before. So that's, that's, that's pretty handy. And then we did our DNS things. And then we get a nice recap. So it tells you for each machine you run this against the number of tasks and sort of the status, uh, you know, the count. Um, there's a bunch of ways to change that. That's way out of scope of, of this. But uh, I mean, everything can be modified, and that's also way out of scope. So, so any questions about that? It's just a super basic kind of playbook there. Yes? I will talk about that in just a minute. Yeah, I skipped that file, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah they're just in a work group right now because I'm building a domain. But yeah, I'll talk about authentication here in a bit. Yes? There is a, that's part of the way that you can modify that output. Look up something called uh, callback plugins. And there are a million ways to change what that output, and there's one that will tell you how long each task took as it's going through. Yeah. Any other, yes? Right. Yeah, that's tricky because what it's doing basically is it's making a WinRM connection to whatever it knows to be the host, uh, very either IP or name, depending on how you define it, runs that thing, and then has to get a return. So that channel has to be open that whole time. If you change the IP out from under it and it drops that connection, it'll, it'll fail. And, and Ansible will say, ah, I failed and, and, and stop execution of everything. So it's a little tricky. Um, something like that you might want to use uh, maybe some DSC. To kind of set it into a maybe do a, set it into a reboot and then come back 
and, and I've got an example of that here. But yeah, you got to be cognizant of that because it's very much needs to be online and connected for the entire execution. So yeah. Any other questions on that? Okay, let's go to our second demo. We're going to get a little more advanced here. Actually, we're going to step away from our domain lab and kind of do some ancillary stuff. Um, oh, that's the file I wanted. Okay. Um, so to talk about your, your question about the credentials here, there's a file I skipped called the, this all.yaml. Uh, one of the other many places you can put variables is uh, in this folder called group vars. Ansible, because it likes the folder and the relative path structure, will look and has some, some kind of built-in features. It's going to look for a folder called group vars. If it finds one, it's going to assume that those are variables that are for our inventory groups. And so it'll look for a file named after said group. So I have, remember I had a group called DCs and one called members, so I could have made a dcs.yaml or a members.yaml in case I made all.yaml. So everything in here, when it imports that, is going to apply and be scoped to all the machines in that group, in this case, all the machines in all. Um, and we'll talk about specifically these variables here in a little bit. These are the, this is the connection information that you need for the WinRM connection. Uh, hopefully you'll see the, the biggest problem with that file is right there on line two. And that's my plain text password for my administrator account that I'm going to use to connect and run stuff. That's a bad idea. We all know that. Even in a demo lab environment, that's a bad idea. Luckily, Ansible provides us with a great way to deal with that. I'm going to bring up my cheat sheet here. Ansible has a command called Ansible Vault, which allows you to encrypt uh, strings and files, entire files, with another password. It basically replaces one password with another, which everything does. But you can store that password outside of your source controlled code, which is super important. Don't put your password on GitHub, please. Um, so there's a, there's a way to do that. So rather than talk about it for a bunch of time, I'm going to run these. It should be pretty self-explanatory how they work. So I'm going to resize that. That should be good. So I'm going to run this first command, Ansible Vault Encrypt. And these files are all, again, you can download them and, and practice. The idea was to build a lab that you guys can play around with. So I'm just going to run this command. I'm going to tell it to encrypt my entire file here. That's what I want to do. It's going to ask me my password. So I came up with a super creative password, Summit 2019. I'm typing it wrong. I thought it was, that was pretty clever, but it's the Wi-Fi password, so I guess it's not that clever. <laughs> Great minds think alike or something. I don't know. OK, and so there, I've encrypted my file. You totally can't read that. It says it's AES-256 encryption. I believe it. Um, and so there you go. That's that a file. It's totally encrypted. You can't reverse that or anything, unless you have a quantum computer, I guess. That's a thing that people do. So that's encrypted, and that's great. Uh, let's say now we want to uh, change something in that file. We can also decrypt it. Same command, just with the decrypt option. So we'll run that. It'll ask us, try that again. It'll ask us our password, and we'll actually type it in. 2019. Decrypts it right back to the way it was. No changes needed. So that's great. You, you decrypt it, make some changes, update the password, add some variables, all that. But what if you did that, and then six months later to try to change something, and you've lost your decryption password? And that's saved off somewhere, and you can't seem to find it. You're like, all right, well, I'll recreate the file. I store my passwords in a, you know, you, you all store them in a, another location. You've got a secure password vault. So you're like, great, I'll just recreate the file. But you can't remember what all the variables were in the file, because six months ago, right? You either documented that somewhere or you're just stuck. You can recreate the password, but you're stuck with the rest of the file. So there's another option. If you look at this file, the only thing we really care about is that password. We don't mind if people see the names of our variables or the username, maybe, or the connection strings. That's fine. It's really just the password. So we can encrypt just that string. So let's do that. So we'll run the Ansible Vault encrypt string command here. And you can see it, it, we tell it. What, what string we want to, there it is, what string we want to encrypt and then ask us the password and give it a name and, and, and so we'll run that. So we're going to do the same passwords of summit 2019. And I'm saying it all out loud so you guys can help me remember in case I forget. All right, so now we have output to the string our encrypted value string. So what we can do, because we gave it a name, you'll notice the pattern looks similar to what's in our file. We can copy this, replace this. And now we have our cake, and we can eat it, too. We have our file, and we can see all our properties and our values, and we can still edit the stuff that we want to edit. But our password is encrypted. And so now when we, if we lost it and we had to recreate just the password, we could get just the password. Or if we want to change just the password, we can change just the password. So that's great. So let's save that. And now that we are encrypted and secure, let's see what happens when we run our playbook. Run that playbook here. Oh, error failed. Attempting to decrypt, but no vault secrets found. 
We encrypted our file, but we didn't tell Ansible when we ran it how to decrypt it. It doesn't know the password, so we need to tell it. So let me scratch this over a little bit. So when we run our playbook, we're going to use many of those options that we saw in, the, in that slide. The one being ask vault pass. Now, I'm, I'm using this all very interactively. There are ways to put those in a file so you can use them automatically in, in, you know, in, in, in unattended workflow type of stuff. But I'm trying to keep it simple here. So we're using ask vault pass to prompt us for the vault password. We're also going to use step to walk through our playbook. Because I'm all about the segues and natural transitions. Although if I point them out, I guess they're not that natural. <laughs> Whatever. I'm a professional. OK, so let's do that. We're going to ask us our vault password, 2019. And then it's going to run. Um, and let's go ahead and look, gather facts, yes. So, ooh, neat. Vault format error. What did I do? That's new. That's a new error. OK. Unhexlify error? <laughs> All right, let me run my encryption string again. Neat, that's fun. I probably, yeah, all right, let's do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I probably copied it wrong when I copied it or something. Maybe, yeah. Well, yeah, no, so that white space is cool. Ignore the red squiggly. That's just uh, YAML being dumb about that. Yeah, they, there's, there's a couple issues that they ignore about fixing that, but. 2019, we're just going to do it again. All right, what well says successful? So, all right, copy. Yeah, it's different every time, so it's some magic algorithm, yeah. No, I had the string in the command uh, over here. So, yeah, see, I say vagrant encrypt, yeah. Oh, wait, no, copying this. Can't talk and copy at the same time. Everybody, shh. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Save it. That looks fine to me. All right, let's try our playbook again. What? Why? All right. Where uh, Charlie's, no? Uh -huh. All right, all right, well, we're just going to, yeah. Uh, we're just going to pretend that we did that. <laughs> Seriously, it worked this morning, even. Yeah, all right. So this is totally encrypted right there. That's encrypted. It, it, I don't know. All right, we're going to run that. Is that what it is? It's some, yeah. Probably something like that. I don't know. I've done it exactly like this like a dozen times and never, I don't know. I don't know. Line endings? Okay. Okay. Could be something like that. That's probably, yeah, that's probably what it is. <laughs> this fails fast. It's agile. <laughs> All right. Let's just carry on. Yeah, this is between encrypting the password being hard and using the password being hard. <laughs> All right, so let's, we're going to run that. Let's go over and let's talk about our playbook. Ignore all that stuff. Okay, so we're going to walk through these. So I, I wanted to include, other than the vaulting thing, which is super important when it works, um, is a bunch of other modules that I think are super handy when, when dealing with things. One of those, the first one there being uh, win ping. And that is more, no, not that again. Oh, sorry, yes. No, it is only tied to that vault password that you give it. Yeah, so you can move those around. Yeah. Um, okay, so win ping is a handy module. Uh, it's more than just an ICMP ping. It actually makes a full WinRM connection like any other module, runs some stuff. It actually returns pong as the text that comes back because um, they're, they're clever. But it's a great module because that gives you your end-to-end -end connectivity. So if you want to know real quick or at the beginning of a run if something is, if anything else is even going to work, run win ping. If that works, there's a pretty good chance that all your other modules will work. Uh, the next couple of, uh, of, of modules there are debug and pause. And those I like to run together. Let's just run these real quick. Um, 
Debug is basically what it says. It, it'll just output a variable uh, or a message string. You can do practice some substitution, and in, in if you get your, you know, if you're building a string and you want to see if it comes out okay, and that's great to do with pause because if you bury that, you know, way down in your playbook, you want it to do a bunch of stuff, get to there, output that to the screen, and then stop and let you look at it, and so then you can come in here and look and say, oh yeah, now that looks cool, uh, everything's fine there, everything's good, or oh no, that's horrible, I want to kill it. And so what pause will do is pause for however long you've said. We've said five minutes, but you can break that early. We don't have to stand here and do the awkward stare thing for five minutes. We can uh, decide what we want to do. If everything was, if it was horrible and, and we built our string wrong, we could just abort out and it would end right there. In our case, everything looks cool. We verified our, uh, our data is good, so we're going to say Control C and C and keep going. And that's really useful for troubleshooting. You put debugs all over the place. You can set conditionals on like verbosity level so they won't run all the time. It's check out that the, the uh, help documentation on that. It's super useful. Um, another recent, useful one is this win shell. You can just run a, a simple command. You want to run PowerShell. You know when you're in DSC and you're like, oh, I'm going to use the script resource, but just today I'm totally going to go write a module tomorrow when I have more time. And then you never do. This is that for, for Ansible. This is totally like the temporary thing until you write a module or forever. Uh, so, but win shell is just that. It run a shell command and it's just straight power. After the colon, it's just PowerShell. Uh, you don't have to do any weird escaping or anything. You just type your PowerShell and it'll, it'll run it. And my poor machine can hear the fan going crazy. So all these commands are taking a lot longer than they need to. Now these came back changed, but all I did was a get child item. I didn't change anything. But WinShell, Ansible doesn't know that because WinShell doesn't know what I ran. So just the way they wrote the module, it will always default to changed. And you can, there's, some, there's some ways that uh, you, can, you can do more logic around fixing that. So, but that's something to be aware of with WinShell. It's sort of a best effort. It doesn't know what you did. It's kind of trying to guess. Um, and that's great. Uh, Windshell can be multi-line as well. So if you have a larger script you want to run, put a pipe and then a carriage return, and then everything that is indented, because YAML, uh, will be your script. And it'll just keep going until you end your script. And you can do all your indenting and new nice clean PowerShell, multi-line, so you can read it and run that. Uh, and you can see here I'm doing, uh, you can do Jinja substitution. And that will do the, Ansible will do that substitution of whatever that Ansible variable value is into that script and then run that script. So it's kind of a, it's an order thing. But if you want to inject custom stuff into that script that executes, you can do that. Um, the downside to that is that Ansible, because Linux is uh, text-based, it likes text. And you can tell from the, uh, we're going to look at the output of that win shell command that we ran there. And yes, it totally sucks. That's the hint. Nope, not up there. We want to run yes here. So we're going to run that and look at the output. Okay, we're gonna. That's our, I mean, that's if, yeah, that's if you were looking at it and you cared about looking at it with your eyeballs, that's all right. But it's not good for anything else. And that's actually a, a list of each line. It scrapes each line independently, so you can reference, you know, one line at a time. Like when you did batch scripting back in the day, and you'd like parse the line, and uh, it's bad. Um, but anyway, they try. And then, but the actual standard out single value is oh, that's so bad. Carriage returns and new lines. Ugh. They try, but oh, Linux. Anyway, we're spoiled. We like our objects. We like our PowerShell. We want structure, right? But we have a text. That return is text, so we have to send text. So the best way to do anything with that is with uh, JSON. That's the best way to represent complex objects in text to keep them intact is with JSON. So what we can do is run our same command, get child item, and convert it to JSON. And this would be in the shell, so it's gonna, PowerShell is going to convert it to JSON and then return that back to Ansible. So if we run that, it'll take a minute to run because my poor machine is slow. And we're going to stick, use a register to stick that in a, in a variable. And then we're going to use debug. We're going to do an output. What we're going to do here, this is one of the other options with debug, is build a string. So we're going to say the message is equal to with this value. What we're doing there with the pipe from JSON, that is a Jinja filter. And there are about a billion of them. So it's worse than the variables. You talk about glitter. That, you can do everything with YAML programming with Jinja filters. You probably shouldn't. But what we're going to basically do is take the standard out from our PowerShell that created JSON at standard output JSON text, convert it back from JSON text into objects for Ansible, lists and dictionaries in the YAML sense. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and run that. And that looks, like, that looks like JSON, right? Yeah. So you can't tell if that's actually text or actual objects, but it, it looks right. So to prove it to you, to do the magic trick, nothing up my sleeves. I don't even have sleeves. Um, 
we're going to output that. So we're going to do some, we're going to do some programming here, some YAML programming. We're going to use set fact, which is a handy module to create a variable. Set fact, set var, whatever. Or set fact is the name of it, but facts and bars are the same. So we're going to create a fact called just names. And what we're going to do, we're going to do a loop, and we're going to loop through uh, all of these objects, pull the full name property, and stick those in a list. Just to kind of illustrate that these are objects that you can do object stuff with. So let's set our fact, ignore all of that. <laughs> And then we're going to output our variable. And debug says, hey, we've got just names. And so that's what you can do. That's what we're used to dealing with objects and properties. And that's the best way to do that is convert it to JSON, convert it back from JSON, and do your stuff. So, um, and that is the end of the first play in our playbook. Any questions on that real quick before I move to the next? OK. So I, I mentioned we're going to get a little more complicated as we go. So a playbook is a play in a file, but technically it can be multiple plays. And the way this is cool is Ansible kind of can get into less just configuration management, and you can kind of start to get into sequenced orchestration a little bit. So what we're going to do is we did a bunch of stuff on our Windows machines. Well, now we're done with that. Now we're going to go to do something on another system. In this case, we're going to use a local host, which is our Linux system here, and we can do a module locally to connect to various things. In this case, we want to, uh, maybe we want to connect out to a REST API. Those are popular right here. The kids like REST APIs. Uh, so let's look at how we might do that. Uh, and I want to also want to do layers like an onion. I'm going to show uh, code snippets all at the same time. So let's use the URI module. Hey, there's some suggestions there. I can just say URI. Oh, they got a code snippet. Let's see what that looks like. URI is the name of the module for doing uh, web requests. It's like invoke REST method in Ansible is URI. So we're in URI, oh, ooh, look at that. That is a snippet, holy cow. And it's a good snippet, it's got tab support, that's what you should have, it's got uh, choices, so if, they, if they've defined it like that, and all of this comes from the official Ansible documentation on this module, which I mentioned the documentation is really good, every module has robust documentation online, the Ansible extension turns all that into code snippets, you can see that the comment after each one is the text from the documentation, so you don't have to go out to the internet, you can just do it right in here. I'm not going to let you watch me uh, type this out for a half hour, so I just kind of wanted to show you the, the code snippet. So we're going we're gonna to kill that. Uh, any questions on any of that before we go on to some more slides? Yes. Uh, yes. Well, you could set a variable. That's tricky because, yeah, you, so you would do that, you could do that in one play and then set a variable. And then you'd have to do another play to, initiate, to, the, to the machine that you want to connect with so that you would use those variables. Like you couldn't do that while you're already uh, connected you know, to that machine because it's not going to refresh that variable, it's already using it. But yeah, you could totally, you could totally do that and set it in memory and, and do that, yeah. Yes? Yes. The indentation, because YAML. So yeah, that, this dash hosts, and then everything is, is going to technically be indented under that. And then when you get done, you go back to that first line, say another dash hosts, and that's another play. You can, yes. I actually mentioned that uh, a little bit later. But yeah, that's something that I always forget to do. But it's a really good idea is to do dash name at the top of your play. It'll indicate the beginning of a play and give you the same useful output on the string. So yes, that's a good point. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So the question was, how do you, how can you pass credentials into a playbook without actually having them defined in your source code? So uh, one of the, the, there's a couple different ways of doing it. Um, Probably the best way in the Windows land is to use the dash E option on Ansible Playbook, which is the extra vars option. And that's one of the ways, and you can pass in any number of variables uh, to that playbook, and it'll come in at the command line. You can type that in. And that actually, uh, those set precedence at the highest precedence level. So anything you put in extra vars will override anything you have in the playbook. So that's the best way to do that. Yes? Uh, Kerberos is best if you have a domain and everything's configured. I haven't built that yet, so I don't have it, but yes, Kerberos would be the way to go. Yes. 
I've got a whole set of slides on that here in just a minute. Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other questions on, on this stuff here? Cool. We're actually doing good on time, so that's awesome. All right, I'm going to kill this and go Ansible. Bring us some PowerPoint. All right. Let's talk about those variables that I kept saying I was going to talk about eventually. Here we are. So let, we're going to talk about some Windows stuff here, and we're going to talk about Kerberos. Um, when you connect to a Windows machine, this is the basic set of information you need to give to Ansible. You need to tell it how to do that WinRM connection. Obviously, you need a username and password, and we learned how to potentially encrypt that. It totally works. I promise it works, but uh, not in PowerPoint. So uh, username and password, we're going to tell it the kind of connection, which is going to be WinRM, obviously. Uh, that's there because SSH for Linux and other stuff for whatever else. Uh, WinRM, of course, we can define our ports, 5985 or 5986 if we're doing SSL. And we can define the transport. And here's where you say NTLM or Kerberos or certificate if you're the NSA uh, or credit SSP if you just don't like security. Um, there's a bunch of options. Anyway, whatever you need to do, it, it supports all those options. And this last one is my favorite, WinRM message encryption. So much so that I dedicated several slides to it. So let's take a trip down memory lane. WinRM on Windows. When you get a basic vanilla Windows box and you check Enable Remoting, it creates a listener on 5985. But it's cool, Windows is cool. They don't actually do plain text. There is encryption of the message with inside that. So if you harvested, tried to harvest some data, you'd be encrypted. That's how that works by default. You can turn on plain text, but you all know better, right? It's, it technically supports it. It's not out of the box. Uh, the other option, if you want to do it, is to use SSL encryption of the entire connection. You can Put a certificate, define, define all that, uh, create a listener on 5986 attached to that certificate, and do connections that way. That uh, is cool. It takes some configuration, and it's unique to each machine, so it's hard to sort of automate that at scale. Um, and that's, that's a problem. The problem, though, is that initially, this is how Ansible worked. You had two options. If you said 5985, it was expecting plain text. If you said 5986, of course, it was expecting you to do certificates. Um, and that was sad Panda Day because I've got several thousand servers and I didn't want to put certificates on all of them, but that was kind of my only option until um, around Ansible 2.6, PyWinRM 0, 0.30, and I remember the number because I was so excited when it happened. They added support for message encryption. So now, using that Ansible WinRM message encryption value, you can say 5985 with message encryption, and that matches exactly Windows default settings. So no longer do you have to pre-configure anything. Fantastic. The reason I mention it and dedicate three slides to it is uh, the community, Ansible community, uh, to their credit, spent a bunch of time and documentation and work helping you do those certificates. Almost everything you read about this, blog post and official documentation will say, you got to do certificates. Here's a helper script and here's how to do self-signed. And, and so when you read that stuff, you think, oh, I've got to do all this stuff. Everything says I have to do it. You don't. Not anymore. So. That's awesome, but I wanted, to, I wanted to bring that up, so use that value. Um, the other big deal is Kerberos double hop. Sad. So Kerberos double hop authentication issues have been around forever. It's not something you run into a lot of the time uh, in day-to-day -day business. You know, the examples you see online are like, oh, if you connect to a web server and then it tries to impersonate you to a SQL database, but we don't do that kind of stuff. What we do, though, is win our end connections and then try to do stuff. Um, and so you'll run into it more with Ansible because everything you do in Ansible for Windows is that first hop, right? You connect to a Windows machine to do something. So if you wanted to, say, do something in Active Directory, you probably shouldn't connect from Ansible directly to your domain controller and run some random script. That probably is not a best practice. Your security guys should get mad at you if you do that. So what you might do is, is go to like a jump box, some Windows box, anywhere, and then from there, use the actual AD commandlets to go in the right way. But that's a second hop, and that will fail, and you'll be sad. Likewise with database stuff, no worky. File copies, network share copies. You connect here and then say, copy from the network down to here. That's not going to work. Um, and so you'll run into that a lot more. So, but there are several different ways of addressing that. So there are a couple options. There's uh, credit SSP. I just wanted to, it's, this is not a preference order. I just wanted to get that one out of the way first. Uh, this is totally not the one you should be using. But if it's constrained and you know what you're doing and you can control it, it might be right for your environment. But that's an option. Um, it does require some configuration on the endpoint because Windows doesn't turn that on by default. Unless you have that GPO set that turns on everywhere and then you don't. I'm sorry. But it probably requires some configuration. And we just talked about how we cannot do pre-configuration, right? So that's not ideal for those reasons. 
along with all the security implications. Uh, another option is Kerberos delegation. Uh, you could allow that. Now, I haven't actually tested that one. I just pulled that out of the documentation. It should work. Um, but again, though, depending on your AD setup, you, especially with admin accounts, you may not allow delegation of those credentials. You probably shouldn't. Uh, so that may require some talks with your AD folks. Um, and again, you know, and then it's, it's limited. You, you can only delegate the, the account you connected with, which may be fine, or it may not. A better option, so it's got its own slide, is become. Become is a built-in Ansible option. And it comes from the weird Unix land of sort of become root or become super user, sort of self-elevate execution. In Windows land, all it means is run as. That's it. It doesn't mean uh, you know the UAC elevation stuff. It has nothing to do with that, which was weird at first. But no, it just means run as. When you see become, it just means run as. But because it's built into Ansible, you can reference that as, a, as an option on tasks or on entire plays. You can define those variables the same way you do other stuff in Ansible. So it's very integrated and works really well. And it's flexible. So you're saying run as. You could run as the same user on that system, and then it would initiate a new connection to make that second hop really just a new first hop. Or you could run as a completely different user. You can run it as system. If you want to do some stuff like Windows updates, when you got to run those as system, you can do it with something like that. Uh, that's why we have where you connect to a domain controller. Maybe that first hop, you use a server admin account. And then you do a become to run as to the domain connection as a domain admin account to do domain stuff. So there's a lot of flexibility there. So this is probably about the best option. Technically, you can also use WinDSC, which we'll talk about here in a minute. DSC, if you remember, runs by default as system, but you can give it alternate credentials. Uh, so you could have WinDSC execute the script resource and give it alternate credentials to run some code. And that's like playing shoots and ladders. It's kind of roundabout, and it'd be, it technically is an option. Mostly I included that because I'm all about the natural segments, uh, segues to WinDSC. So we're going to talk about WinDSC now. Uh, this is a nice uh, chart and code in PowerPoint. Is, somebody said that was a really good idea, so I tried to do a bunch of that. Uh, PowerShell DSC, this is what it would look like if you were doing DSC, like a configuration document, right? You have your registry resource, and then the name, and then you got your stuff. Uh, in this case, we're talking about how we would turn on SMB1, which is a really bad idea, but it was a cool example. And I got on Twitter and I told Ned Pyle I was totally going to do this, and he said not to, so I did it anyway. So, <laughs> you know, tell me what to do, my own presentation. So, but anyway, this is what that would look like, right? You, DSC run as credential, you give it a credential object that you've defined or passed in or whatever. That's PowerShell. And then key value pairs for all the properties of how to do that. I should like obfuscate that so no one finds this on YouTube and thinks it's a good idea, like redacted. <laughs> um, so that's how you do that in PowerShell. In DSC, it's pretty similar. So we have the WinDSC module, and that's a sort of a, a launcher for DSC resources. So you call WinDSC for everything, and then the first thing you need to do is tell what DSC resource you want to execute. So resource name is a key value for that. And then there's a little trick because uh, D, or when, or Ansible does text back and forth, right? JSON and all that stuff. And you can't do complex objects in text, so I can't pass a credential object across a text stream. So what they did with DSC when they wrote that is they decided if you do a, a, a pair of values with the same uh, prefix, and then you use a suffix underscore username and underscore password, it'll see that and it'll say, oh, that's a credential pair. And it'll, it'll bundle those up in memory, create a credential object, and then name it what your, your shared prefix was and pass that. So that is the equivalent to that. And it can be PSDSC run as credential. If you're doing AD, it can be the domain administrator. Anything that's a credential object that you have to pass, you can use that. And you can use a bunch of them. So that's pretty cool. And everything else is just values that get passed to the resource. So whatever you need in your resource, you just keep listing them. And it just passes them right through. So that's pretty cool. And we'll see that here in the, in the demo about a lot of that. Um, behind the scenes, this is using invoke DSC resource, which is pretty cool. It just runs a resource. A uh, couple of caveats, though, there is, is it's up to you to get your resource files out on your target machine. There's no pull server in this scenario, so you've got to get them out there. And we'll talk about a couple ways of doing that. Uh, the big thing, with, uh, another thing with invoke DSC resource is you can do, you can do DSC pull servers and LCM and refreshes or invoke DSC resource. You can't do both, so you've got to turn off your LCM if that's running. And I've got a script here uh, that I'll show you in the code in the demo to, to talk about how we can do that. Another thing that's a kind of a catch that I actually ran into and blew some stuff up at night, unfortunately, it's always at night, right, uh, is that you can only run invoke DSC resource one at a time. 
So if you were connecting to a box to configure it, you're fine, right? But if you were using that jump box scenario and like connecting to it had a, with a playbook and then going to like AD or something, and then your buddies were running that same playbook because they're trying to be effective employees and do work, and boom, you got invoke DSC resource running at the same time, it'll blow up. So if you're in that scenario where you could potentially collide, then consider not using DSC because that could bite you in the butt at 2 a.m. because it always gets you at 2 a.m., right? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's do some more code. Go. All right. All right, now this one, uh, this takes a little while to run, so I'm going to put it in the oven first. And we run this real quick. Now this one I pre-encrypted, so we'll see if it works. If this one doesn't work, that'll be really weird. Nope, oh, nope, two O's. Yeah, that's the, that's the extra command. It's the secret. <laughs> All right, playbook dot, nope, dot YAML. Ask vault pass. Let's see, here we go. Summit 2019. There he is running, cool. Okay, so let me close this and we're going to let that cook because that takes a little while. Let's talk about what we're doing here. Shrink this down. We're getting a little more complex here. We have three different plays. And here's where you would, uh, yeah, here's where you could use the name uh, property on a play, and you totally should because it's better than the alternative of putting a comment, <laughs> right? It's the same. It's effectively the same, but, but much more useful. So that's, that's the option. So let's walk through what we're going to do here. Basically, we're going to do all our, uh, our DSC pre-configuration stuff first. Then we're going to use DSC to build our domain. Then we're going to uh, use uh, DSC again to join our members to that domain. And that's just, I wanted to illustrate the, the sort of the delineation. Like when you, when you end one play and use another, what's the sort of the line there? And the line there is when your hosts that you're, you're acting upon change. So in our case, we're going to do all our DSC stuff on all our DCs. Then we're going to create the domain on just one. And then we're going to connect our members to that domain. So each time our host list changes, and that's where you want to do a new play. So let's walk through some of these. And if you have any questions, just uh, throw something or holler or anything as we go through. So first thing we need to do, we mentioned, was get our DSC resources out on our target machines. A couple of different ways of doing that. The first one is the coolest, win PS module. That connects, uh, that actually is sort of a wrapper for PS Git. It actually connects to your target machine, uh, runs PS Git or whatever they call it now to connect out to the PS Gallery, download the module, install module, and stick it in the right place. And so then you have version control and all that, and that's cool. What's also cool is there's an option in that module to use a private repo. So if you have an internal corporate repository, you can put that in there, and it will connect to the target machine, register it as a provider, uh, and then download from it. So that's super cool. And again, it's idempotent, so we're just declaring it should be present. Um, because I don't have much faith in, in uh, uh, the Wi-Fi here, I'm going to just expect that that's going to fail, so I have ignore errors here true. So in case that fails to download from the internet, that's cool, it'll keep going. And then I'm going to use win copy, that's sort of my backup. Uh, and what you can do, I've already pre-downloaded Active Directory, so I've got that in my files list here. Say so copy that to the modules folder on the destination. But you think about it, that's even kind of cool, because really I'm copying from a Linux folder across the network to a local Windows folder over that WinRM connection. It's super easy. I mean, you just define the, the two paths. Um, and you can do a lot of options. You can copy remotely and say from this Windows machine to this Windows, or this Windows folder to this Windows folder, or you know, vice versa. Or there's a lot of different options with that, but it, they make it pretty easy to do that. So, so those are the, your kind of your basic your two options for uh, getting your resources out there. Uh, the next thing we need to do is disable our LCM. So. I just kind of wanted to show some extra, extra folders. So win file is a way to create folder directories or files, stuff like that. So I'm going to create a temp folder, and then I'm going to copy the script out there. And then I'm going to use win shell to execute the script file. So I've copied it locally. So I'm saying win shell, and it's just PowerShell launching that PS1. So you don't have to have the, win shell doesn't have to have just code. You can just give it a file, too. That's an option, which is cool here. So let's look at that file and see what we're doing. There we go. OK. No, thanks. All right, so if you're familiar with DSC, this, this might look familiar with you, to you. This is a local configuration manager configuration to configure the local configuration manager. Um, and you know, we define configuration and settings. And what matters here, what, what invoke DSC resource looking for is this right here. Refresh mode equals disable. That's the important value. Uh, but you can set other, you're configuring the LCM, so you can set other values. In my case, 
because I am using DSC to do a domain, I want DSC to handle the reboot. I'm talking about that, that live connection thing. I want it to go ahead and reboot and then come back and then I'm going to wait for it and I'll talk about how to avoid it all falling apart. But in my case, I want DSC to do the reboot, so I'm setting that value. Um, and, then I, and then I have my, my code to compile them off and then configure it. And this is all, I'm going to transfer this over, so this is all running on my target machine. So it's like a remote local compilation, right? Like local auto machine, it's creating them off all locally, the remote, remote locally. Yeah. I don't know how he would describe that, but that's, that's what's happening there. Um, and that, that works, so and that's a pretty good way of doing that. So. Uh, where were we? Okay, and so those, that's our, basically our prerequisites. We have our resources out on our target machines. We got the LCM turned off. We're ready to use WinDSC. Any questions on any of that before I go on? All right. You guys are excited to see some action, right? Cool. Okay, so now we got our second play, and we're going to create a domain. Now, we only want to run that once. We don't want to create the domain at the same time on multiple DCs. That would probably end poorly for us. So we're going to connect to one host. There's a bunch of ways of doing that. Since DCs is just a list, our group is just a list, we're going to use that nomenclature to say, pick the first element out of that list and run it on that one. I could type DC01, whatever, if I wanted to be specific. There's a bunch of different ways of doing it, but I just kind of wanted to show that it's just a list at the end of the day. You can just do that. Um, variables. There's another place that you can put variables. We haven't run out of spots yet. VARS files, you can reference those here and say, basically, take this file that I, I define here, uh, and import the entire, all the variables that are in there, and import the entire contents into this play. And that is going to be scoped to this play. So every task on every host, it, it, those variables are available to. So that's one of the many options. I lost count. I think it's like six or seven so far that we, <laughs> where we're putting stuff. Um, okay, so, so yeah, that's a way to import variables, and then we can create our domain. And we've got a name here, create domain on first DC. Uh, WinDSC, so we're going to use the XAD domain DSC resource. We've got a couple credential objects we've got to pass to it. Uh, interesting thing about the safe mode administrator password, technically it just needs a password, but if you look at the resource, it defines that as a credential object. So we have to do a pair so that WinDSC will know to turn that into a credential object. So we just give it a garbage username, uh, just so it knows how to, it, it won't, if you do just underscore password, it, what's that? It has to have that pair is what it's looking for. Uh, and again, we can call it whatever we want, and those are the names of the these are the names of the properties that the resource is looking for. Um, and then we're using a bunch of defaults here. So that's going to create the domain. And then DC, uh, DSC is going to do the reboot for us. So it's going to come back and say, yes, I'm done. And then it's going to kick off a reboot. And normally Ansible would then go to do the next task, find the machine offline, fall down and fail horribly and cry in red tears. Um, so what we're going to do instead to avoid that is we're going to use wait for connection, which is a built-in module to do just that. Uh, it won't try to connect and then fail. It's going to say, all right, I'm going to try to connect uh, many times over the course of whatever, and eventually it'll come back up, and then I'll connect, and then I'm going to be good. So that's kind of a way to keep it from falling apart on you. Uh, and then, so yeah, we're going to wait for the DC to come back online. Once it's done, we're done with that play because we're done with that host. So then we can simply join our members to the domain. Um, so yeah, members, same kind of fail, deal. It's like totally looking, starting to look, you know, familiar to you. The, how how plays start. Uh, I've got my vars files uh, here, but I've also added vars. This is number seven places to put variables. So I can define a variable directly in here. Um, so here, quiz time. I'm defining domain name here, and I also have a domain name defined here. Which one wins? Does it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna open, you guys were paying attention. <laughs> but, but just to point out, you know, huh? I chart. I chart. Yeah, I go back. Hold on. No, I, I just wanted to point that out because it's easy to get yourself in a state where you think this is all working the way it should be working, but maybe not. So that's probably true. That makes most sense. So, but yeah. Yeah, well, that's true, right? I mean, that's not a guarantee. So, but anyway, yeah. So look that up. If you start putting domain uh, variables in a lot of places, watch out. Uh, okay, so now we need to do the same sort of pre-configuration on our member server. So we're going to use WinPS module to download and install our module. We're going to expect that to fail, so then we're going to copy it locally. Now I threw, a, I threw this in here to show you guys a loop. So a loop is kind of cool. Uh, I can define a list here. Uh, that's a static defined list. I could do it in a variable, you know, define a, a, a list object in a variable file or something like that. Um, but what's it going to do? It's just going to do a copy. Now, I'm doing substitution. So in, in PowerShell, you know, for each object, you use dollar underscore to reference the currently iterating member of the loop. Uh, 
In Ansible loop, you use item. So item is the name of the variable for whichever one you're acting upon. You use the two braces to do that substitution. It puts that text in that text and then runs that module. And then it'll copy them both out there. So that'll, that'll get our resources out there. And same deal, we're gonna copy out our script uh, and then do our, uh, DS, disable our LCM. Now in this case, I wrote a different script called no reboot, because I, I wanna do the reboot on this one. Same exact configuration we saw before, I just have reboot set to false. Um, because again, you can do all kinds of LCM configuration settings in that script while you're in there, if, if that's what you need to do. And I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run the script, so this is the same stuff we saw before. Um, in this case, uh, I'm gonna go through here and I need to wait for the domain to come up. My DC's done, installing and rebooting, but you know, AD is doing stuff to make the domain uh, come up. So there's this handy DSC resource, wait for AD domain. I'm gonna say, cool, wait for that, and then do some substitution to put the domain to wait for. Once that's up and online, then I'm going to use my X computer DSC resource to add the, machine to, or the machines to the domain. And again, doing my substitution, creating my credential object uh, with my domain admin username and password, and that's all done in memory, encrypted, so there's not sticking it in files anywhere, so that's nice and secure. And then, to answer your question was about the reboot at the end, uh, we have this option in DSC called, or in Ansible called uh, notify. Uh, and what notify does, it sort of sets a, sets a flag, right? So we have this concept of handlers, which are post-execution tasks, really is all they are. It's just the same tasks. In our case, we're using win reboot, but that can be anything. And so what notify does is says, if this uh, task came back and said, I changed something, not, not okay, if it actually comes back and says, I made a change, then notify will flip the flag on that handler, right? I give, the handler has a name, and so that matches there, and then, it, and then it flags that on. And then, once that's set, it's, it's a flag. So you only need it to set it once. Um, and any, any flagging of that will run. Once all the tasks are finished, it's sequential, then it'll run any handlers that have been notified. So in this case, uh, we've notified reboot needs to run, and so it'll do a reboot. And that's great when you do like a bunch of software installs. You know, and you only need to reboot once at the end, but any one of those might trigger a reboot. So, and any of those might not need to change, so you can, that's a good way of, Nice clean way, just have a bunch of things do with the notify, and then if any of them actually change, then you'll get one reboot at the end. Uh, but again, that can be any task. Yes? Okay. Yes, the question was, uh, can I just use Ansible to query the state of like an actual configuration document with the LCM and all that? Probably, uh, that's not really how it's kind of designed for that interaction, you could probably put that together. It would probably be painful to do that. Uh, and then you have all the pain of having to deal with compiled MOFs and potentially encrypted credentials. Um, so it gets, it gets hard. You could probably do that interaction, yes. So, any other questions on any of that? Yes, in the back. That would be a really good idea. The question was, do I ever use uh, list hosts or check on Ansible Playbook to sort of run a what if scenario first? That would be a really good idea. I don't because I'm a bad programmer. Um, but yes, that would be something, especially in these big things, you probably should do. Um, Worth mentioning on check though, um, you know, what if is very uh, controlled. If you run a what if, you know it's gonna just what if. Check mode is up to the module authors and most of them, uh, you know, we're gonna talk when we build a module, most of them respect that and they look at check mode and they make sure it's not enforced by Ansible. Once you execute that module, if they didn't code it to respect check mode, it'll just run. So test check mode before you use check mode. Something to keep Keep in, mind, keep, uh, keep in mind, so. That's a good question. So the question was, uh, how are credential objects with become encrypted as they transfer over the wire? So along the lines of transcription, do this exercise. Turn on, uh, in GP edit, go in and turn on uh, super mega script block logging and all the ch flag all that stuff. Run a basic playbook with one task in it and then go look at your log. The way it works is amazing. You could do an entire session. It, like it takes the whole thing, turns it into a base 64 string of the entire script and the module and the options, packages that up in JSON, sends that over, builds a module from that on the fly in memory, then passes the credentials to the task execution and runs. It's amazing. Uh, specifically about uh, uh, credentials in plain text, I think that's all covered with that, um, but I don't know specifically. I, I believe it's, it's, yeah, seriously, do that exercise. Turn on all your logging and run a task. It'll blow your mind. <laughs> it's really cool and kind of terrifying the way the way it, it does that, the way it runs those, so. Uh, let's see how, let's walk through this and see how we did here, okay. P 
PS module failed, that's cool, we expected that, so we're ignoring it. Uh, Ansible, usually when you get a failure, it's done. One failure and it's done on that machine. So it's important to handle errors like that. It won't just keep going. But with ignore, it'll keep going. Uh, we did our copy, um, disable the LCM, then we get our second play, and see how much better that is? So play one, play DCs. It just told us the group we were running on. Second play, because we used the name property, tells us play, second play creates domain. So that's way better. Um, so yeah, use name on play, plays and tasks. Highly recommend it. Uh, anyway, then we created the domain, and that one took a long time. This would be where that, uh, how long does each task run would be super useful, because that one takes a long time for some reason. Uh, then it waits for it to come back online. The next play, because we used a comment again, it just says members, which is not as useful. Um, and then we, then we did some, so here's our, here's our loop, and this is kind of interesting. This is so weird. Th that one works every time, the computer management uh, PS get. It, that one goes to the gallery and gets it, and the other one fails. So you're 0 for, I don't know, Wi-Fi, 0 for 1. That, that worked. That's cool. So that actually downloaded. And because that downloaded and worked, I mean, I totally did that on purpose so I could show this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was on purpose. Uh, yeah. So that did it on, it, it installed computer management on the machine. So when it got to the copy, they're green because they were already on there. Uh, and then the ECO2 already had Active Directory. So it, it returns back, the point being, this is that loop, but it returns back the individual status from each task, task execution on each machine. And then you can do the dot change and you can do programmatic stuff against that. So that's super handy. Uh, and we disabled, copied the script and disabled the LCM and all kinds of exciting stuff. Uh, waited for the domain, joined the machines to the domain, and then we ran our handler. So because this was, uh, was changed, then it tripped that flag and ran this. If that hadn't been changed, you wouldn't even see, it, it wouldn't even, it, it's just gonna, it's gonna skip it because it didn't activate any of those handlers. So we got one reboot at the end, which is super handy. Uh, that's that, we got a domain now, which is super cool. Any uh, questions on any of this? All right, we're doing great on time. Cool. Am I like talking like super fast and you guys are like, why is he? I'm gonna pl play YouTube on slow mode or anything. Hopefully you guys are, you guys are, that's, yeah, so, okay, but hopefully some of this is, is, is helpful. Well, you're not paying attention. You're surfing Twitter on your thing there. That's, <laughs> I can see the reflection. You're not fooling me. Yes. Computer management? Okay, so for the people at home, use computer management. Don't use X's. That's right, they were changing, the X's and the C's and stuff is all gone now, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, I've been off doing Ansible and pay not paying attention to DNC. I can't keep track. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, any other questions on any of this? Let's go do some more slides. How about that? Huh? Yeah, all right. Boom. Okay, so let's talk about custom modules. Ansible, writing your own Ansible module. Why would you do that? Uh, well, there's, there's more now, but there used to not be very many Windows Ansible modules. There was like 10 to start when I first started messing with this. It's like, I don't know, what is it, like 75 or so now? It's a 50, 75. It's a pretty good list. It grows every time. But again, it's, that's not a lot. Uh, so there's a pretty good chance that there may not, what you're trying to do may not already have a native Windows Ansible module. Uh, DSC resources. There's probably a DSC resource for what you want to do because there's a lot of those. Um, but may, there may not be. It may be one you want to, doing something weird that, that DSC doesn't already have one. Or because of what we talked about before, you may not want to use DSC, like the jump box scenario, or maybe you don't want to turn off the LCM. Uh, so there might be reasons you can't use DSC. Um, or a big one is, you know, if you want to gather data. DSC doesn't really do that, so that may be an option. Uh, and maybe you want to be a good programmer and you don't want to use WinShell forever, and so you want to package that up the way you're supposed to and have something a little more robust so that you can control, you know, the outputs and the change status and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then this is, so this is a big one. Uh, maybe you want to get data, maybe there is already a native Ansible module to get the data you want. But it's in a weird format, and then you got to do a whole bunch of like YAML programming to pull lists out of dictionaries and do filters and gnarly stuff to get the data that you actually care about, and that can be painful. So you think, well, I'll just write my own version of that module to give me the data exactly the way I want it, so I can go on with my life and have a human readable configuration. Or you're just a weirdo, and you want to know if it's possible, and you want to do dumb stuff with Ansible, which is the best reason, by the way, for <laughs> just about anything. So that's, uh, that's my excuse. So let's talk about module authoring. The first thing you need to know, take notes, Windows modules are written in PowerShell. Linux modules are written in Python. Because we all know PowerShell only runs on Windows, right? <laughs> right? 
No, no, and no. PowerShell runs everywhere now. So you can, in fact, and the Ansible people will probably say this is a horrible, horrible idea, but you can totally write Ansible modules running in PowerShell core and run them friggin' anywhere. So that's a shebang, if you're not familiar with the term. You put that as the first line in your, uh, in your script, and that tells Linux what to use to execute your script file. So it doesn't matter what the extension is. If you put that up there and you have PowerShell Core installed on whatever machine you're running this module on, it'll use that to execute it. One caveat that I run into, I actually do this in production, and I probably shouldn't, but it totally works. So, <laughs> so but one thing I ran into is uh, there's these helper modules, which will I reordered the slides. We'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, there's some helper modules that you can use that help you write these modules, hence the name. Um, and those, uh, those are old for Windows, and they're hard-coded somewhere in there to use PowerShell. So those won't work if you put that shebang at the top of your thing. So you can either go and find the source code and modify that. Don't do that. Uh, you can just not use them, or just do this ln-s uh, on, your, on your Linux machine and create a shortcut from PowerShell to PWSH. No idea if that'll break anything else or if it's a good idea, but it totally works for custom modules. Now that's, you know. Uh, buyer beware. But yeah, you do that one change and then boom, you can write any module you want. And then you're like, okay, well, I know PowerShell, so let's get busy and let's write some, some stuff. So um, in, in the demo here, I'm going to be a little more normal and I'm gonna, we're going to build a Windows module. But check this out because this is really cool. I've done some of this in production. I was talking to some of you guys the other night about doing some stuff with PowerCLI and anything that's a cross-platform module, you can potentially run in Ansible and do some really cool stuff. So check that out. I think this is an area... Everything seems to be moving in this whole magic cross-platform world. Um, so I think this is an area that uh, could potentially grow a lot. Uh, whether it's a good idea or not, I don't know, but it's fun. So um, how are we doing on time? Anybody have a time? Seven minutes. OK, cool. I can go through some of these. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to skip a bunch of these slides, review them later. I've got a bunch of information on like exactly how to write a module. But instead, I'm going to go to the demo where we actually write a module, and we'll just cover it all there. So. Uh, but check these out, uh, download the, the slides, it's got a bunch of reference material, and there's a link at the bottom that covers all this in great detail. So let's skip out of all these slides and let's go straight to our demo. Oh, I've got a, yeah. We totally could have done the slides. All right, well, we're in here now. No, you know what? I, this is my presentation, we're doing slides. We're doing our slides. Gotta tell me what the... Okay. All right, we're back in here. All right, where were we? Okay, so a Windows module is relatively easy. It's just a PS1 file. You don't have to have a module manifest or a certain folder structure or versioning or any of that. One PS1 module file, name it after whatever you want the module to be called, .ps1, and that's it. Throw it in a library folder. We'll talk about where to put it so that Ansible can find it. Um, and that's kind of it. So the, the, the idea, though, is, is basically you make a PS1, does whatever it is that you're trying to do with your module. Um, the important thing is that you pass JSON in, because Ansible likes JSON. JSON goes in, JSON comes out, everybody's happy. Um, the way it looks like, if you've ever gone like CMD and said PowerShell.exe, script file, and then some arguments, you know, that's how it feels. It takes whatever you stick after your script, turns it into dollar args, a big blob of whatever, passes that in, and then you can reference dollar args and all that. It's, as I mentioned before, it's way more complicated the way it does all that. That's with the base64 encoding and the, the secrets. So check that out. It's super cool. But that's, effectively, this is what it feels like. Um, so now try not to be distracted by the beautiful artwork here. I know this is pretty amazing, so try to focus on the content. Uh, the important thing here is, is this is your script, right? This is our blue box, not black box, because PowerShell. So that's your code, and it does whatever it is you need your code to do. Args list goes in. JSON comes out either, yes, it worked, or no, it didn't. And the format is a little different. So those are your two output streams, and that's what's important. So don't use write output, or write error, or write host, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, or return, or control your outputs. And it's going to be one of these two. We'll talk about that. So on the point of input, uh, that args list is everything that is in your playbook. When you have properties on a Module, that's what goes into your args list. Plus, at no extra charge, all of these built-in variables. So those come along for the ride. So you get things like what version you're running, uh, check mode. So if you're using check mode, this is how that comes through. It's a Boolean. And you've got to catch that in your code and, and reference that variable. So some of these might be useful. You could check verbosity and stuff. 
Uh, I don't know what you'd ever do with Fansible SC Linux Special FS, but it's there. I don't know. That might be cool for somebody. Uh, but that, that's all what comes in that, in that dollar orgs, this big blob of JSON. It's just a big JSON text. On the way out, uh, Ansible's looking for a couple of things. This output JSON is looking for an object with a couple of important properties. So changed is that value that Ansible is going to look so we can report to the user. And that's going to be a Boolean value, true, false. Uh, it defaults to false, so if you leave it off, it'll be false. Same with failed. is looking for a true, false on fail. Did it fail or not? Uh, again, defaults to false, so it assumes success. It's an optimistic program. <laughs> Thinks the best of you. Uh, so that's cool. That's, that's comforting. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, if, you did, if it did fail, if you set failed to true, it's going to be looking for a message uh, property. And that's where you put your error message. So if you say failed true, message equals, I have no idea what I'm doing here. This was horrible. Errors or mistakes were made. That's what comes out in Ansible in the red text. And then whatever else you want. You can do standard out if you want to you know, screen scrape at people. Or you can set any other property on your output object. A common theme you'll see is when you write a module that is just for gathering information, like a get something module, uh, people will a lot of times use a Ansible underscore facts property. So you'll have whatever your return is, dot Ansible underscore facts, and then everything you gathered will be in there. That's a common sort of theme. There aren't any like hard set rules, but that's something you'll see if you look at a lot of code for modules that already exist. Um, and so that's not too bad, but they make it even easier. So they have some helper functions in Ansible module utils legacy, which they're the only ones. There aren't new ones. I don't know why they call them legacy. There isn't like dot current or anything. But that's the newest ones that are out there, and here's I can tell. Uh, so you put a requires statement up there under your shebang. Uh, put that up there, and that will, that will cause that to import. Remember, Because this isn't a module. This is just a script. So you could use requires instead of fancy import module stuff. Uh, so these are your primary functions that you're going to care about. Uh, the top two are handling your inputs. The bottom two are handling your outputs. Basically, what we're doing here is taking, uh, we've got $args as a blob of JSON text. Parse args uh, function takes that and turns that into a PS object with properties for each of the parameters. So it makes it a little more PowerShell-y and does the stuff with check mode for you. So it sets check mode, uh, a check mode variable based on that default thing that came over. So that's that, and that creates a, a PowerShell object. Then get Ansible param is kind of cool. You point that at your parse args, and, and you can define individual parameter variables for each of the properties in the args output. And there, you can do a bunch of uh, parameter validation. So you can do things like cast it as a certain type. So the type should be string or int or whatever. You can do uh, like fail if empty sort of things. You can do validate set, uh, some of that stuff. It's not quite as full featured as an advanced function, but it's pretty close. Uh, so that's where you would do all that, and we'll see that here in the code. Uh, and once you're, once you're done with that, you basically have all your parameters and, and variables, and you do whatever you want to do in your little blue box. And then you handle your output. So it's two things, right? It either worked or it didn't. So fail JSON, if you run that command and pass it the output object and an error message, it'll build your output object with, you know, with, with your return and the, with the dot message property, and it'll format that. It's not anything you know, earth shattering or groundbreaking. It's just kind of a convenience thing. Same with exit JSON. It just turns it into JSON and does some formatting. Uh, but the key thing is to remember is use those. Um, don't use write error or throw or return or, or don't have extraneous text you know, output that you don't catch because that'll totally get confusing. Control all your outputs and have them only be one of those two things. So that's important. Uh, we're going to skip this. We'll talk about this in the code. Uh, documentation uh, is technically in Python. <laughs> it's OK. It's just like, seriously, it's a text block. It's like you say at the beginning, like three tick marks, and then at the very bottom, you do three tick marks, and it's just text. So uh, you can look in kind of, best is to look at a current example of a module. It's all kinds of weird and denting and formatting to make it just right. It's kind of weird, but it, it's, you know, it's a good idea. So, and I got a bunch of slides on that for some reason. I don't know why I put like four slides on documentation, because no one really cares. So let's just go to the demo. Um, so, but now, see, now I'm all messed up because you made me skip my, hold on. All right. So let's, and we're, yeah, we're going to, oh, yeah, we got another 15 minutes. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's look at why, what a playbook might look like. So we built a domain, right, in the last thing. And everybody knows the first thing you should do as a good domain admin after you build a domain is create a bunch of admin users, right? Hand them out to your friends like, hey, you're an admin, you're an admin, you're an admin. That's the best practice. It's not a best practice, no. Don't do that. But anyway, we're going to do that here for fun. We're going to create a bunch of admin accounts. Um, and so what we might do, let's say we want to use Ansible to find some information about the uh, primary administrator account. 
which is what we're using to connect here. So we might do something like this, right? One option would be say, well, let's use get ad user in a wind shell, uh, and we can do some filtering. Say, get you know, get all the ones that say admin something. Do our little JSON trick so we can do stuff with it, and then we'll put them in a set fact so that we can turn them back from JSON. And then maybe we'll do a loop and we'll try to build a list and try to find the one that is what we connected with. It, you know, it's a mess. So that might be one that would work, but it's not pretty or, you know, your boss is going to be mad at you for not understanding what you're doing. Um, and so that would work. The second option, we could be like, all right, well, let's do more in Windshell. So we'll like get a D user and then we'll do the filtering and over here, right? And, and so we'll get the one user in, in there. We'll do some Jinja substitution and do our JSON trick. And that's a little cleaner, but it's still not great. And then, of course, if we decided, oh, well, now we want to run it, we want to look for a different user, then we're coming in here and we're changing our code, and that's not ideal. Um, so our third option, which is the third one, so it's, of course, the perfect one, uh, this is a lot more readable, right? What if we could just use a module to do the kind of query we want to do and then return data in the way that we want to do it. So like we say, I want to search Sam account name for this value. And I only want to get back these three properties, right? And, and if I change my mind and I want to do, get a different set of properties, I'm not changing my code. I just change the list there. So uh, this is a lot more readable. Your boss is going to be a lot more comfortable with what you're doing. He looks over your shoulder. Uh, and that's cleaner. So that's the example we're going to do. We're going to write that module. Um, well, I've already written it. I'm going to show you that module. So here in this, uh, in our folder, we've added a new folder called library. Um, and that's just sort of a common thing. What we've done here is, uh, we use, I don't think I actually talked about the Ansible config file. Well, that's basically a way to sort of override defaults for a lot of things. But in this case, we're using that to set locations for things. So you know, we're telling it, hey, that's where our, host, our inventory is located in our, this host file. Our library, instead of looking in Etsy, Ansible, blah, 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 library, where all the default modules are, we want to look in dot library, uh, so that it, which is this folder we just made. So you don't have to call it library. You call it whatever. That's a common thing is to call it library. So then it knows to look in there. It'll still look in the original. So you know, you're not losing all your other modules. But this adds support for that. So now you have your module. It can find it. That's really the only requirement. And then name it what you want to call it. Um, so let's open it up. And I even wrote documentation because I'm so good. So if you want to learn how to write documentation, use this example and check it out. I'm not going to talk about it because that's kind of boring. Um, so let's talk about our PowerShell. That's more fun. Ooh. And you can do Python interpreting if you, you know, doing that. Well, we don't want to do that. So let's start at the beginning. Okay. Begin at the beginning. So we are going to require our mod uh, legacy modules, helper modules, and obviously we need to require Active Directory. Uh, interesting point of note, Ansible runs all these PowerShell scripts in strict mode. So set that so IntelliSense will be smart and not cause you pain. Um, and then we're going to start our input stuff here, right? So uh, we've got uh, our, our $args is our big blob. So we're going to use parse args to turn that into params, which is going to be an object with properties. And that's where it does the check mode stuff. So that it, it, it does that for you. Um, now I've included here these options for check mode and diff mode. Diff mode will, is like check mode. It'll show you what changed uh, between the two. But anyway, it's weird. So um, we are doing a module that's just gathering information. So we're not changing anything. So check mode isn't really relevant to us. Uh, I included that here just kind of for your reference. So you can see the names of the variables uh, you know, that come through. And you can reference them. And then you've got to you know, set that. So if you write a module that does change stuff, use those and, and make your users happy. Uh, so then, and then we're going to come through. Let me, Shrink this down here. So, so we're gonna. This is our. This is effectively our param block, right? So for every property that we're passing in, right? We looked at a module. So filter property, filter value, return properties, all that we saw. For every property that you care about doing anything with, define a parameter here using that line. So get Ansible param. The the you give it the object that they're all in. They're all in that one object. And then you do your thing, right? Here's your type casting and fail if empty and validate set and you can have a default value. All that kind of stuff. So that's your parameter validation. That's kind of cool. That, that works pretty well. So that's that. And at this point, now we're done. Now we got a bunch of variables. Now we do all our blue box stuff, right? Do whatever our, our logic is going to be. Uh, in this case, we're going you know, to get AD user. So we're going to do a query. And we're going to do our return properties. So we only get the data back we care about. And here's where we're, uh, oh, we created our return object. Oh, it was just, just a hash table. Um, you, don't, you don't have to do it like that. Uh, a common thing tends to be people will like define it and as they go. Since we're not changing anything, we know change is going to be false. So 
kind of build it as we go. That tends to be the, but you can do, you know, your PowerShell however you want. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, so a common thing I mentioned was to set everything in Ansible facts. So we're going to put uh, the results of our user query, everything that came back from get a to user in Ansible facts. So at this point, it's not JSON yet. It's still PowerShell. So it's objects and arrays and all that kind of stuff. Um, so just native PowerShell, you don't have to do anything weird yet. Um, yeah, so then you do your queries and, and all that kind of good stuff. Now I'm doing this in a try-catch because I'm a professional programmer. Um, so I'm going to do some stuff here. Uh, a couple things, you know, and this is kind of the logic of what you want to do, right? Like if you, if you use get AD user and you query AD, and for a user and it doesn't exist, it'll throw an error, this identity not found exception error. In our case, um, the way we want to do that, we don't want Ansible to fail because Ansible fails hard. So if we don't find a user, we don't want our whole playbook to stop. So what we're going to do is our try catch, and so we're backwards querying and saying, if basically, if it's identity not found exception, set Ansible facts to empty, not no, empty, empty string. Uh, if it is some other error, then yeah, we have a problem. So we're going to use fail JSON, barf out immediately, stick out our error message and say, yeah, something went horribly wrong. Uh, and then when we're done, if we get to that point, right, we're just going to say exit JSON, give it that return object that we've built, and it's going to build our output and all that. So, um, none of this PowerShell part is best practice. So, you know, if you think, oh, that's the wrong way of doing whatever, yeah, probably. But the point being, you know, inputs and outputs are what matters. And then everything else is up to you to write it in the right way. So, uh, that'll totally work. So, any questions on any of that? Yes? Right. It takes care of that for you. Yeah, DSC resources you got to put out there, but all the Ansible modules that, that this like this script, it, it does it does that as it goes. Yeah, it transports that, and along with all the parameters and all that stuff for you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on the custom modules? It's cool, right? You get, you can totally get yourself into some trouble. Do some PowerShell core and like really break some stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, and it's not super complicated, right? Like you can do whatever you need to do. It's just PowerShell, so that's way better than. Python. I probably shouldn't say that out loud anymore. I got to start like Python's cool. Python's great. I love Python, right? We should practice that. I'm gonna get in trouble. Anyway, um, okay. So that's all that. And I've got like oh, I still ran out. I got a couple slides. One more slide. Let's, oh, nope. Oh. Okay. There's more. I mentioned earlier. There's way more that I didn't talk about than what I did. So I got a bunch of links here that you can check out for more information. Uh, roles is a really cool way of taking your playbooks when they get real big and chunking them up into uh, sort of task execution sequences and and applying them in a very modular sort of way, so it sort of extends that modularity past the task level. That's really cool. There's a whole built-in folder structure to help you do that in an easy way. Definitely check that out. Uh, templates are a big deal for Linux guys that like files. So you can take a file and then templatize it. If you've ever used convert from string, it's kind of like that. You can mark it up, and then as it transfers it over to the machine, it'll substitute a bunch of information and variables and put it on the machine. Again, Linux people like files. That's more useful for them than Windows, but it's kind of neat. Uh, blocks is a way to add some extra logic and grouping of your tasks inside the execution. Uh, Jinja filters, I mentioned that. We used from JSON. There's a friggin' billion of these. You can do some really cool stuff and some really scary stuff with those, but check those out. Uh, plugins is cool if you want to get really weird with Ansible. You can change the way everything works. Uh, the output thing is the callback plugins, uh, but there's a lot of plugins that you can change a lot of default behavior. That's all Python, so love it. Learn it, love it. Um, strategies is interesting. That's a way, like when you're running on a bunch of machines, 100 machines or however many machines, or even just two, it'll keep them in sync. Like it'll run the task on one, on all of them until this task is done on all of them before it moves to that next task on all of them. You can change that up with, with strategies and say, just run them all in a big wad, I don't care, and finish fast. So there's some stuff there. Ansible Tower is super cool. Uh, that takes everything we saw here today puts it behind a web server with role-based access control, form validation that you can fill out, a REST API that you can call, and gives you sort of that control server model. Uh, Red Hat will happily sell you that for a large fee, or you can go look up something called AWX. That's the open source version of the same thing that Red Hat just takes and sells, because that's what Red Hat does. Um, but they're cool, we like them, they give us stickers. Uh, this is the GitHub page for Ansible. It's all open source. You can go out there and browse through that and look at all the code and all those Windows modules that are built in are in there and you can kind of see how they do it. Um, the Ansible community is very robust. Uh, not a lot of Windows guys, so let's change that. A lot of, you know, Linux -y network type stuff, but they're very active in, in general. So if you want to learn more about how to get involved, check out that link. It talks about how the community kind of works. 
And then finally, this presentation, everything you saw today, all the slides, all the demos, that launcher thing, uh, all the, the text files, everything you need about the notes about WSL is all in there. So you should be able to take that, go home, use it, play with it. It should be really awesome. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Fill out your surveys.